Thank you, Doctor. Good afternoon, greetings, and thank you to each and every one of you for taking time to be a part of the memorial and celebration of the life of Patricia Ann Kowalski, the woman I've known most of my life as mom. Today's a special day, thanks, uh, as it would have been her 86th birthday. And to all of you that have been a part of my mother's life, I want to especially say thank you for your contribution to her happiness. And again, thank you for being here today. And I'd also like to welcome all the people and our family members that are watching on the live stream. Thank you, Rick, for setting this up. It is very meaningful to our family and many cousins and aunts that are watching today. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to follow along with me, I'll be reading um, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. I'd like to echo the sentiments that Jack expressed in terms of welcoming each one of you again. And I'm so delighted to see you join us in the celebration of a beautiful woman who was not only beautiful outside, but beautiful inside as well. I'm going to invite the congregation to stand, except for the family, it's your option, whether you would like to stand or not, and uh, to actually stand and to join me as I offer the opening prayer. Please join with me that the God of all comfort will be here with us today. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you on this bright and sunny day to thank you for the sunshine that you gave when you gave us Patricia. We thank you for her life. We thank you also for the Savior who, because of love that has been expressed so greatly by his Son, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you that Patricia was able to embrace the gospel message and to make it a part not only of her life passively, but to make her life a light that will lighten the way for others. And like Naomi of old, she let that light shine in her home so that her family might be able to see their way through the darkness unto the great light of life and embrace the gospel message as she did. We thank you for her ministry in the home, that the ministry of motherhood was important to us. We thank you for her husband as well, and for the fruit that her home produced, that they might be of service not only to their community, their church, but to the world itself. We pray, dear Father, that you would enable this tradition of service to your kingdom's cause may continue and grow as the family grows. Now we pray, dear Father, that as this life has been brought to us and enriched our lives, we pray that you would allow ourselves to become servants as well and be inspired by the light that she shed abroad to all men. We thank you that this Holy Spirit came to touch her heart, to bring her into the fellowship of believers so that she was a witness to all of us. And Father, we ask now today 
that all of the soldiers that you have brought here today to commemorate this wonderful and fruitful life might be likewise inspired to do your will. And we ask that as we journey home, you would lighten us with the light of life as you did your soldiers with the great hope that we have that the resurrection will occur and that we will be able to go home and join with Christ in the heavenly courts as well. Now for all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confessed, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Thou was their rock, their fortress, and their might. Thou, Lord, their captain in the well-fought fight. Thou in the darkness dim their one true light, and we praise you for it and ask that you will still give us the light of life so that these who have come today might be soldiers faithful, true, and bold, and fight as the saints who nobly fought of old and win with them the victor's crown of gold. We ask this in the name of him who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Hymn number 462. 462. Together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, but a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Mission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, numbers from my side, angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my. First, everyone, perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. We have another scripture reading this morning, if you'd care to follow along with me. It is in Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. And I will be reading from the New International Version. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like, a, like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night 
She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes fine linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Good morning. morning. Or good afternoon, you're right. I'm just so used to being in church in the morning. And, uh, you know, we come here today, this is actually a dual occasion. Uh, Not only are we remembering my mother-in-law, Patricia Kowalski, but we are also able to do this on her 86th birthday. And this is her birthday, and that kind of brings a special meaning to this service because part of what I'm doing with with this life sketch is celebrating her 86 wonderful years and 86 years of having an impact on just about everybody in this room and many other people who are not in this room. And I, I was reflecting as I was preparing to come up here that I probably knew her for just under a third of that 86 year period. And I'm blessed because I got the good part. I mean, I wasn't a little kid growing up who got scolded. I was the one who married her daughter and brought her a, helped bring her a grandson. And as I get older, I start realizing how important grandchildren are. Now, that's not a hint to you, Christopher and Flora. You can wait, but it, it, <laughs> it is an important part of our life. And I hear a loud amen from uh, Flory's dad, Ryan, there. And I, I've had a, an opportunity to really reflect on Patricia over the last five weeks since she died because of the outpouring of emotion and also reflect on her from a way that I did not know her. All of the comments from people who knew her as a teacher, and Margie Good, one of Christopher's teachers at the Metro School, is here, and I have praised the teachers over there so many times about the job they continue to do today and the job they did helping mold my son, but I've never had a chance to really reflect on Pat in that capacity, how she molded so many young lives. At least one of her students, Robin, is here today. She felt she had to come. Others are watching on the live stream. I've had people say that they became teachers because of her. And this is is an obvious testament to her. And that's something that's been an impression on me these last five weeks. I got to know her after her passing in a way that I never knew her before. But now I get to talk about the way that I knew her. And when you you learn of a certain death, you're often in shock. And for some of us, the tears don't come right away. I mentioned this beforehand at the earlier service, that as I was writing and researching this, 
this, this is when I got emotional, remembering things, looking back on her life, but I also want to remember some of the happy, some of the fun points. And I think about a famous quote from her brother-in-law, Pete, who died really around the same time of year 15 years ago. After a long road trip, they came back to our house, Pete, his wife Ruth, and Pat, and he looked at me and said, Jeff, the nice thing about writing with Pat is you don't need a radio. <laughs> now in my business, I could have taken that as an insult, but I knew exactly what he meant. You know, there are people who like to talk, and in many cases, they make it easy on the rest of us. Let's face it, it's easy when all you have to say is, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, oh really? I've done that with other people, and they came away saying, wow, that Jeff is such a fascinating conversationalist. But all joking aside, I want to focus on the real conversations we had. And I had some very deep conversations with her. Said so Prior to the, the previous service, so some of the family members may not have even known of all the deep things that we talked about. We talked a lot about children, and as a school teacher, children were her passion. And she did have a pretty painful youth, anybody who knows her. And it was amazing how she always kept an upbeat attitude. She always had a thankful heart, which is a reminder to all of us that no matter what happens in our life, we need to keep a thankful heart. She thanked the many people who helped her get through school. You know, that was during an era where financial assistance wasn't as available as it was today. And I've got to remember how upbeat she and her husband Emil were when Sherry and I called her to tell them both, I mean, we, we called, you've got to understand here, from the Fox Theater here in Detroit. It was intermission, and Sherry said, you think I should call our parents? We should call my parents now and say we're getting married? They were doing a, uh, a show there, it was intermission. We went to a phone booth. For you younger people, that was a precursor to cell phones, so you needed to carry some change with those. And... Uh, when we called her mom and dad, to, and Sherry said, guess what, I'm getting married, I'll never remember their response. To who? <laughs> you see, Sherry, I had met her parents shortly after Sherry and I had met, and she had taken pains to say, we're just friends, don't, don't read anything into it, and apparently they hadn't. But you know what? <laughs> From that point on, she never hesitated to make me a part of the family. She would do anything to make me feel welcome, and she would do anything to make me food, and more food, and more food. Pat, as anybody knows her, knows she loved to cook and loved to watch people enjoy her food. But we had a few differences. I mean, I'm a meat eater, she's a vegetarian. But we both found we had one vegetable in common, carrot cake. And she also taught this very meat and potatoes, non-ethnic guy, the joy of pierogies. And I'll tell you, there's one thing that Pat loved more than cooking, and they're all in this room. Her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. Jack and Leslie's daughters, Emily and Jenna, who are here, came along first. Then our son, Christopher. Then Emily and Jenna gave Pat great-grandchildren. Jeremy, Zachary, Sophia, and Landon. Hopefully you'll meet them all here today. They're just wonderful young people. And I'm very glad that Pat was able to share in Christopher's college graduation. I mean, this was, this was an incredible year for our family. We had Christopher's college graduation. We brought Flory into our family with a wedding this past year. And I mean, instantly, Flory, she became your grandmother too. And she loved you as much as she loved the rest of us. And she Bast in the glory of those events. And we did get to spend a lot of time traveling with her. There were some simple trips. A visit to a condo in Florida where Pat, her sister Joyce, and the rest of us would play games late into the evening and they would tolerate my bad jokes, or at least try to tolerate my bad jokes. And probably the greatest trip of all, Pat was able to travel with us to Israel. It's a journey that I recommend to all Christians. It really makes all of those stories you hear in the Bible come alive. But there was one really special trip. It was a trip to Scotland. Sherry had arranged that trip so Pat could go back and see the country where her father was born. We even knew the town where he was from and had a photo of the house where she once lived. 
And as we were making our plans, God intervened. One of my managers just happened to mention to me that his wife was from Scotland. We were talking, and it turns out he was from the exact same town that Pat's dad came from. And that brother, who still lives there, was coming here to Detroit for a visit. We met, and what I was expecting to be just, you know, some time to get some information about the town, how do we get there, can I rent a car, should I take a train, whatever. He said, don't worry about it, we'll take you on a tour. Like, what? I mean, a total stranger said, I'm going to take a day off work, we'll pick you up, we'll take you there. But he did more. His son took that photograph and found the house where Pat's dad once lived. And it was a thrill to me. I could feel the connection that she had with her father as we walked around that house. And that was one of those memories that she was able to carry with her the rest of her life. You know, it's amazing how fast a quarter century can fly by. Remember how precious life is. Hug your loved ones. Tell you how much you love them. Appreciate them all in your heart every day. My own mother died about this time 14 years ago, so I know of the phone conversations that will no longer happen, the family events that will be different, but also that life goes on. And for Patricia, her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, friends, family members, and again, the many, many students she touched, a part of her will live on with them. And I'm going to wrap this up sharing a few comments written by the people who loved her. Some of them are in this room. She had the biggest heart and would do anything for anyone if she was able. She was the backbone of our family, Jenna Conklin, granddaughter. She was wonderful, a wonderful Christian woman. My kids absolutely adored her, her niece, Tammy Trace Summy. Pat is the person who played the biggest role in me being a teacher, Debbie Kijak Hess. And something my own son Christopher wrote on Facebook. Sorry, I'm going to embarrass you here. She was a very kind and loving individual and a great role model for me growing up. She would come up to watch me every summer while I was off from school. It would also be here for every holiday season, always making my favorite food. More importantly, though, she helped teach me about Jesus and showed me what it was like to live a Christ-filled life. My grandmother was a light to her community, and she certainly will be missed, but I know I will see her again soon when Jesus comes. And finally, as I mentioned, one of Pat's great passions was food, and it's only appropriate when this service is over, all are invited to a dinner in the fellowship hall. Thank you. Timeless theme, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream, God will make all things new. Crying again, praise, praise 
praises to Christ our King. Slowly the names from the book are read. I know the King, there is no Good afternoon. My name is Mike Fortune. I'm the pastor at the Toledo First Seventh-day Adventist Church south of here a little bit. And uh, that's where Pat would, when she's in town visiting family, come with her great-grandchildren to Sabbath school. And she got the chance to go there with them in the same room, and I know that was a big deal to the grandkids especially, but also to the entire family. Uh, she loved her grandkids and her great-grandchildren. Jack just sent me this note not too long ago about how um, she had even purchased all the Christmas presents already. And when they were down there in Tennessee getting prepared for this service and looking through everything, and they noticed that Grandma had already taking care of all of that. So the grandkids and the great-grandkids were high on her radar. I want to begin today uh, with a verse from Ecclesiastes. Boy, everything slides on this thing, doesn't it? How about that? Okay, that'll work. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says this. <clears throat> For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to be quiet and a time to speak. And so we've gathered here today because this is one of those times to gather together, to comfort one another, to encourage each other, to celebrate the life of Patricia Kowalski, of course, but to remind ourselves at the same time about that song that was just sung in the 
No more night and no more tears and no more any of that. When you flip to the last page of the Bible, there's no more any of that. We have a new heaven and a new earth. And so we can look forward to that together. And I know Patricia was also looking forward to that day. Apparently, she was a pretty active lady. She liked to travel a lot, back and forth, visiting all the family from Tennessee to Michigan to Ohio. I, can, I think it was mentioned she went to these weddings, most recently on April 15th of this year. And um, she was also at the ceremony for Christopher's White Coat ceremony. She is officially welcomed into the Oakland University Medical School. So milestone moments, she was there. She was a part of the fabric of the entire uh, family unit. I love that she kept a prayer journal. I think that's kind of cool. She kept a prayer journal, and I know that's true because Jack shared with me one of the things she wrote in it. And one of the things she wrote in it was about a story I told about a year ago at the Toledo First Church that apparently really struck a chord with her. It's a little longer than I wish to share right now, so I won't do that, but she apparently really liked it, and. Um, reached out to Jack to reach out to me to get a copy of it. And so I gave her a copy of it, and then she took that. I don't know if she read the whole sermon to him or just the story. She read, Jack is nodding, the whole sermon, have mercy. She read the whole sermon to all her friends in Tennessee. So she had a love for the Lord, and she prayed, and she con con connected with God, and she shared that love with other people as well. Isn't that the true mark of a true Christian? If you can't stop talking about Jesus, you just keep, it just keeps flying out of you, you know, wherever you may be, even community gatherings where you may live. Uh, I like that she shared these scriptures and she, she was uh, obviously interested in the love of God. And uh, because of that love, we have hope and confidence even a little bit of joy mixed in with all our sadness and sorrow. But I'm glad you're here today, and I want to thank you for making time as well and being here to support the family. It means, uh, means a lot. There's a book I read recently. Uh, it's called Living with Thorns. It's a good book if you want to get a good book. Living with Thorns. It's called, uh, subtitled, A Biblical Survival Guide. The author, Marianne Freilich, writes uh, from a perspective of trying to provide comfort, encouragement, and tangible tools from scripture to help those that are handling a loss, that are going through some mourning and some grieving. And so I'm not going to give you all 14 steps in the process. You can go get the book if you want. But I would like to share with you here today, this afternoon, just a few. Uh, number one. It's okay to mourn, uh, to mourn and seek God. The shortest verse in the Bible, where is it? John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Yes, he, he wept. Uh, it reminds us that Jesus mourned and gave us permission to do so. His, one of his best friends, we're all his kids. We're all his best friends. <laughs> But one of his very best friends, Lazarus, had died. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, were overwhelmed with grief and loss. And you can hear even a little bit of anger, don't you think? In John 11, uh, verse uh, 21, when Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And so Mary and Martha are overwhelmed and hurting and a little bit maybe even angry. And I think it's okay to be all those things when you experience a loss. It's part of the human condition. I think that's just who we are. It's part of it. But mourning, friends, is not incompatible with seeking God. And that's what I found interesting about this first step. Mourning is not incompatible. And we know this is true because Martha still went out to meet Jesus when he finally did show up, right? And this is in John eleven twenty. 20. It says, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. So maybe some of you are here today because you too understand this uh, principle that mourning and seeking God goes together. 
So you left the house, you came out here on a Sunday afternoon and you're a part of this memorial service to give comfort and presence and spiritual support to this family that are, that's going through this loss. Maybe some of you are here today because you also understand that the Bible explains this in a little bit greater detail in a couple places. Psalm chapter 34, verse 18 is one of my favorite verses. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Psalm 56, 8 adds this, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. We serve a God who loves, who notices when we are going through something difficult. Every single tear that's shed, he notices. He doesn't rescue us from loss or prevent us from experiencing uh, loss or broken hearts, but he promises us that when we experience this, those things, He'll be with us. He'll draw close to us. He'll send believers and friends and others that believe in God to come close to us and be the presence of God with us. A second survival tip. We can make music to God. We can make music to God. I don't know if you know, but there's over 200 specific references directing us to make music to the Lord. Psalm 63, 7 says, Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. But if you can't hold a tune in a bucket, maybe you can just make a joyful noise. That's, that's your contribution. That's okay. I have one person in my church who uh, whistles every now and then, and another one that plays a harmonica. Make a joyful noise. You know, we can do what we can do. Uh, the Bible says this. After David killed the giant Goliath, the town celebrated with music making. 1 Samuel 18. When Nehemiah returned with the children of Israel from their Babylonian captivity, and they came back to Jerusalem, and they dedicated the walls that were being built, guess what they did? They made music to the Lord. They had big choirs, two big choirs with instruments, and they all dedicated this, this rebuilding project to the Lord. This is in Nehemiah 12. And when the prodigal son returned home, in Luke chapter 15, there was music and even dancing. But we can also make music when we're discouraged and experiencing a loss. This is what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 70. So, you have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. Then I will praise you with music. Paul and Silas praise God where? In jail, in prison of all places. He even had a captive audience that was listening to them. And then uh, Jesus, before he died on the cross, the, one of the last things he did with his disciples, he got in the, and before he left the upper room, when he was facing these trials, the Bible says in Matthew 26 that he got them together, and he sang a psalm. Music has always been a tool that God uses to comfort and encourage us. Deuteronomy 31, 20, uh, 21 says this, So write down the words of this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Help them learn it so it may serve as a witness for, for me against them. And when great disasters come on down them, come down on them, this song will stand as evidence against them, for it will never be forgotten by their descendants. So that very day, Moses wrote down the words of the song and taught it to the Israelites. It's possible to make music, or at least a joyful noise, even after we have experienced loss. 
even when disasters come upon us. Maybe you're familiar with Horatio Gates Spafford and what happened to he and his wife, Anna. When four years old, their son, Horatio Jr., died suddenly of scarlet fever. Then a year later, in October of 1871, a massive fire swept through Chicago, destroyed the city. Many lives were lost, and all the property that the gate, the, uh, Sp the uh, Spafford, the Gates Spafford family owned in Chicago. And then two years later, in 1873, Spafford's four remaining children, all daughters, drowned in the Atlantic Ocean when a steamboat that they were riding to England with their mother collided with another boat, and the, boats, and the boat sank. Anna survived, and when a few years went by, they had three more children, and uh, on February 11, 1880, their only son, Horatio, named after the brother who had died, and also named after his father, he also died at age four. So both of their sons died, and then four of their daughters died. And somehow, in the midst of all this loss, he's able to write these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Sometimes God uses our losses to help others seek him. And the reality of the resurrection to an eternal life is something that people do need to hear more about. Lastly, survival tip number three, we can help others going through the same things. 2 Corinthians 1 says this, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So, in short, you can survive loss by sharing loss. And this is... This is something that we can do. God will help us. Patricia knew there was a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to mourn and a time to seek God, a time to make music or at least a joyful noise, a time to survive loss by sharing loss with her community friends, with her families, with her family members, with her friends. She clearly understood that. She was looking forward to the day that Jesus would come again. Are you? The Bible says if we are, those kinds of words will comfort us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and then the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. The Bible says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Jack, Cheryl, family, friends, may God's word comfort you. May the promises inside give us hope and even a little joy mixed in with all the sorrow for the life that Patricia lived in faith to Christ. Let us stand.
hymn number 214. go, I wanted to read you a card. This card comes from Lake Nelson Adventist Academy uh, in New Jersey, where I believe Patricia taught. Here's what it says. Dear Mr. Kowalski, this came to Jack. On behalf of Lake Nelson Adventist Academy, I express our deepest sympathy for the loss of your mother. For us, she was Mrs. Kowalski. Where Lake Nelson is today is due in part to the vision and sacrificial commitment your mother had for Adventist education. But most importantly, her choice to be led and used by God has impacted Lake Nelson for eternity. I am honored to be leading the school where many of the programs and um, not sure what that word is. Programs and... Hmm. Do you remember, Jack? I'm sorry, it's hard to read cursive. Right. <laughs> uh, programs and structures. Structures. Thank you. For, were the programs and structures were formed and stayed by and under Mrs. Kowalski's leadership. Life never prepares us for moments like this. Do know, Jesus is coming soon. Hold on to that hope and never let go. Sincerely, Mrs. Maragato, Principal in Lake Nelson Adventist Academy family. Amen. So yeah, she, her legacy is that it's spreading out and more and more people are going to be singing the song we just sang because of because of her life and faithfulness. She, did you hear that? She, Jack said that she taught her husband in first and second grade. The principal did. Mom taught the principal's husband in first and second grade. The lady that just wrote this card. That is so cool. Praise God for that. Wow. All right, well, it's time for our benediction. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the life of Patricia. Today we celebrate all that she has given us and the legacy of her life on earth. Thank you for her faith in you and that you sought her long before she sought you. May we too have the courage and consistency to live a joyful life of love and faith and long for the blessed hope of your sure return. For as much as God and his goodness and the outworkings of his providence has permitted Patricia Kowalski to lay down the burdens of this life, we do lovingly commit her to God, remembering as we do that all the issues of life are in the hands of the everlasting Father of love and compassion, and that he has promised eternal life and resurrection to those who love him. Jesus said, marvel not, 
For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one who died, but look, I am alive forever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, the home of God is now with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will remove all of their sorrows, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. For the old world and its evils are gone forever. Let us all pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord bring you courage and hope. May the Lord pour his blessings upon you and give you peace. Amen. Be seated. Thank you all for coming today. I mean, you're all very special in our hearts, and we hope you'll all stay and go to the fellowship hall next door where we can have a meal that people have worked hard to prepare for us and we can spend more time talking to each other. So that wraps up our memorial service today. And again, we are overwhelmed with uh, the love of so many people who came. Thank you again for coming.